I would prefer to not open the Torah scroll and to have to read these words. Now Dina, the daughter whom Leah had borne to Yaakov, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and disgraced her. I don't want those words about Dina's rape chanted in the same melody as all others, passing them over as if they are another sacred sentence in our holy book. According to the rabbis, Enitor Lashon Batorah, there is no extra language in the Torah. Each and every word has meaning and purpose. But there are actually no words included for Dina herself. Her pain, her loneliness, her erasure. She never speaks, she never screams, she never cries. And when the rabbis and commentaries do have words to speak of Dina, they often blame her for her rape. The 19th century commentator, the Nitziv, on this verse, Vayetze Dina, and Dina went out, said, since Yaakov lived outside of the town, the verse should have read that she came in, not that she went out. However, scripture wanted to hint that Vayetze, she went out, she went out of the guidelines of proper behavior by going to watch the locals dance and make merry. And the 18th century Orach HaChaim spoke again on the same verse, Vatetse Dina Bat Leah, and Dina went out, the daughter of Leah. He said the reason that the Torah emphasizes that Dina was Leah's daughter, we already know that. We already know that she's Leah's daughter. So then if they're by the principle, Eni Tor Lashon Torah, there's no extra language in the Torah. Why does it tell us again, Vatetse Dina Bat Leah, and Dina went out, the daughter of Leah. And he teaches that in order to facilitate understanding of the cause underlying why Dina actually went out, what her excursion was about. And he says, Dina was Leah's daughter. Had she been Rachel's daughter, she would never have made such an unchaperoned excursion. Her mother, Leah, had gone out to meet her husband. That's how Leah is described in the Torah in chapter 30, verse 15, to marry Yaakov. And something like that, he says, was uncharacteristic of Jewish women. And Bereshit Rabbah, Chapter 80 claims that at the time, Leah adorned herself with all her jewelry, and her daughter copied her mother, giving the impression that she was a harlot. According to the rabbis, Dina didn't know her place, which was, of course, to stay at home. She was too curious and adventurous. She broke boundaries. She was promiscuous, and she was deserving of what happened to her. It is impossible to leave the story here, not only for Dina's sake, but for countless generations of women that have been silenced, erased, abused, raped, ignored, and blamed. This is not the story of the past, but of the present, too. On October 7th, Hamas did not only terrorize, torture, and massacre 1,200 Israelis and foreign nationals, but women were subjugated to sexual violence. Many will never be able to tell their story. But Dr. Kochav El Kayam Levy, who's a lawyer and scholar of international law, gender, and human rights, and who actually I met yesterday. Uh, she's a part of a group that Sapir is with, 
uh, that I met yesterday with our former Shaliach Moshe Samuels. And I met with him before the tefillah. And at the end of the tefillah, uh, she came up to me and she introduced herself. She said her name was Kochav. And not many people have the name Kochav. It means star in Hebrew. So I'm like, I'm quoting you tomorrow. Um, so uh, uh, it was an honor to meet her. But she's doing very, very difficult work. She established a commission in Israel called the Gender Crimes War, War Room to make sure that the story is told. They are working with police and others to gather evidence and testimony and document all the gender-based war crimes that happened on October 7th. She recently presented at a panel at Harvard and after describing the evidence of sexual violence, rape, including gang rape, disfigurement, and other acts of abuse, she said the following. Never in my life had I imagined I would face my colleagues to talk about gender-based war crimes and crimes against humanity carried out against Israeli women and children on such a large scale. And we are assuming that many more cases will surface in the future. We connected one testimony to the next. Suddenly, seeing the big picture, how systematic it was, the extent of the violence, it was a punch in the stomach. But a further punch in the stomach is that international women's agency, like the UN Women, have been silent in the face of the atrocities. Just last week, November 25th, was the day designated by the UN General Assembly as the International Day for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. But still not a word, not one word or statement about the attacks in Israel on October 7th and the sexual violence against women. There was a rally last week at the UN and there will be one on Monday morning at 9.30 to call out the international community's silence in response to Hamas's sexual violence on October 7th. The rallies have been entitled, Me Too, Unless You Are a Jew. I would encourage anyone who uh, would like to go. I have an unveiling for Jack David uh, on Monday morning, so I won't be able to be there. The silence has not been only with regards to sexual violence. You may have read reports in Haaretz and other news outlets of how IDF female spotters stationed on the Gaza border were reporting about unusual activity for a long time to their superiors. Their reports were treated with disdain and dismissed, and sometimes even worse. Someone was almost court-martialed. Fifteen of those young women soldiers were killed at Nahal Oz on October 7th. Seven were abducted, one was rescued, and Noah Marciano was killed in captivity. One of the survivors interviewed, no, not one of the people who spoke, by the way, shared their name, because they're afraid, said, they abandoned our friends to die because nobody wanted to listen to us. It's beneath their dignity to listen to a sergeant who for two years has been staring at the same screen and knows every stone, every grain of sand. Tell them something contrary to what the senior intelligence officers are telling them. Who am I, some little woman, before a man with the rank of major or lieutenant colonel for whom everybody stands at attention? when he enters the room. Devastation upon devastation upon devastation. The Torah is sometimes devastating, and life is too. So I want to bring you this Shabbat one text from the book Dershuni, which you have on your sheet, I think everyone has them on there, that offers some kind of redemption to at least the story in the Torah. This is uh, 
So just for those who don't know about Der Shuni, Der Shuni is a compilation of contemporary Israeli midrashim. There are two volumes in Hebrew and they were translated um, and now there's one volume in English. And the amazing thing, uh, it was edited by Tamar Biala, which actually just a year ago we had a conference here for the launching of the book in the United States. And um, it's Israeli women who have made midrashim. The first volume, I think, was published in 2009 in Hebrew, the second in 2018. And uh, there are women from all over the spectrum, secular to religious. And um, they're also, what's incredible about the compilation in Hebrew is now they're on Safaria. Safaria is a Hebrew website, it's not a Hebrew, it's a Jewish textual website that contains all the canonized texts of our tradition. Um, and now if you look on the section about Jewish thought, you'll see Dear Shuni there, which is just an incredible moment, I think, in the life story of the Jewish people that such a contemporary um, commentary is actually included in the canon of the tradition in that way. This particular midrash called um, da The Daughter of Dina is by Ayala Tzrora. She, uh, she, uh, she died in 2016. She was a member of Kibbutz Yavne and a teacher, a Jewish educator and teacher of Talmud. Um, and so there are a number of midrashim about Dina, um, but this one is amongst many that are so powerful. So Dina is mentioned twice in the Torah. She's mentioned, of course, in this week's parasha with regard to her rape and her vatetse Dina and going out. She's mentioned one more time in chapter 46 when, uh, when Yaakov and his family go down to Mitzrayim. So that's where this Midrash takes off. I'm going to move fairly quickly through the Midrash. I'm not going to speak about all the uniqueness, the very um, subtleties of the text, but I hope you'll get some of it and perhaps uh, over time we'll uh, study it some more. And those, I'm teaching a class on Dear Shuni every Tuesday for those who'd like to come. Uh, so I'm going to work in the English. And these are the names of the children of Israel who entered Mitzrayim. Yaakov and his sons, Yaakov's firstborn was Ruvain and the sons of Ruvain, she doesn't uh, record all the names, but you get the idea. And the sons of Shimon, and the sons of Levi, and the sons of Yehuda, and the sons of Issachar, and the sons of Zivulun. These are the children of Leah, who bore for Yaakov in Padamaram, and Dina, his daughter, all souls, his sons and daughters, 33. So this is the, these are the psukim that Ayala is uh, commenting on, and um, and here's what uh, she has to say. Anything in uh, italics is from the Torah itself. Anything in regular uh, prints is her voice. A man and his house, his spouse and his children went down to meet Zrayim. And only Dina in her loneliness without a man or children. Right, if you look at the list, you see everyone and their offspring, but Dina stands alone in the list which speaks to her um, existential loneliness, which is what she's trying to point out, is that Dina is always alone in the text. And her brothers couldn't speak a kind word to her. This expression is actually used with uh, Yosef and his brothers, and we'll see that there's a running theme in this Midrash about Dina and Yosef. They didn't speak to her when she was young, Thus, sorry, there's some typos. I was typing fast. And Dina went out, Vatetse Dina, to see the daughters of the land. One of the reasons why the Midrashim say that she went out was because she had no companions at home. No one was talking to her. So she had to go out of the house to try to find some friends. They didn't speak to her after Shechem seized and abused her and didn't even ask her what she wanted. As it is written, and they killed Chamor and Shechem, his son, by the sword, and took Dina from Shechem's house and went. So why does she make the case that they didn't consult her? One, because the Torah says nothing of the sort. She's not consulted. But the order of the text is that they killed Chamor and Shechem first, 
and then they got Dina. So clearly, if they were in conversation with her, probably the order of the verse would be reversed. She would have been taken out, then at least they might have a chance to ask her what she thought, but in that case, this was not. So they didn't speak to her when she was young, they didn't speak to her after she was raped, and they didn't speak to her when she was pregnant. We'll get to that piece in a minute. But sought to kill her. As it is written, and they said, will our sister be treated like a whore? They'll say all throughout the land that there's a whore in Jacob's tent. So who knew that Dina was pregnant? We didn't know about, there's nothing, of course, said about her in the story. But there is one midrash in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer that says this, that Dina was pregnant uh, by the rape and uh, and her brothers were very upset about that because it exposes her licentiousness, baby, basically. And so the brothers, yet again, um, are more worried about the reputation of Yaakov's house than they are uh, about the baby and the offspring or about, um, or about her well-being. And so they seek to kill the baby, and Yaakov, um, when the baby is born, puts a, uh, a gold uh, like necklace on her as a, like an amulet for protection. And as the Midrash goes, and this is very Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, it's a very fantastical Midrash, says Michael, the angel, picks the baby up and takes the baby down to Mitzrayim. She's adopted in Potiphar's house. She becomes the daughter of Potiphar. And who, be, who is the daughter of Potiphar? Who does she marry? Joseph. Okay, so according to the Midrash in Pure Keter Rabbi Eliezer, Yosef doesn't marry an Egyptian woman because our rabbis don't like the fact that he marries an Egyptian woman. He marries his niece, who is the daughter of Dina from the rape. Everyone with me? Okay, so Ayala is taking that midrash and keeping it in the story. She's holding that story. And she honors the fact, or honors, she is disdainful of this instinct of the brothers once again to do no good by Dina. They want to kill the baby because they don't want the exposure to the house of Yaakov saying that there is a whore in the house. But actually, Yaakov here is redeemed a little bit. Yaakov's, um, OK, so that's the baseline of the story. Yaakov's sons called Dina's daughter Osnat. And we see that in the, in the Torah itself. Why do they call her Osnat? Uh, that's a fairly typical name in Hebrew. It's not very becoming in English. But um, that the disgrace of her birth should be remembered and that her mother remembers her disaster. A son in Hebrew is disaster. And her rape, her ones, her burden, really, that she went out to see the daughters of the land. So according to Yaakov's sons, her brothers, once again, this is the fourth time that they've treated her poorly they name the baby for the pain, right? They assert a name upon the baby that only remembers the horror of it. That she's, this daughter, this baby Osnat is bound to bear the burden of what happened to her mother and the pain hoisted on her as, that, as Dina's daughter. And Yaakov took note Yaakov also takes note in the story of Yosef, the dynamic with Yosef and his brothers. He said, al tikru osnat, don't call her osnat, but at nes, but you are a miracle. So he flips the word around, he switches the letters around, and instead of calling her osnat, he calls her at nes. You are a miracle. And he marked her with a gold frontlet, and he dressed her in a coat of many colors, another allusion to Yosef, to save her from them. 
And when the day of Yaakov's death drew near, he repaired his son's deeds, as it is written, and to Yosef were born in the land of Egypt, Menashe and Ephraim, whom Osnat, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of Anon, had borne to him. And Yaakov said to Yosef, and now your two sons, born to you in the land of Mitzrayim, before I came to you to Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Menashe will be like Reuven and Shimon to me. So just to make sure we're following, the end of the book of Bereshit, we know that scene where Yaakov is on his deathbed and he calls the sons of Yosef to him, Ephraim and Menashe. And he blesses them with the blessing that we say uh, every Friday night, Hamalach Ogo Eloti. But according to the Midrash, the sons of Yosef are actually his grandchildren, his biological grandchildren, right? It, they are his biological grandchildren, but they're Dina's, they're Dina's grandchildren, sorry. They're Dina's grandchildren. So they're, he's their great grandchild, but he treats them as if he's their father, repairing the instinct in the family to push them away, to say that they don't belong, to say that they're the children of um, someone who was a whore or a harlot. And so she concludes the Midrash, and a redeemer comes to Dina, Uva Medina Goel. This Midrash completely rewrites at least part of the story of Dina. It can't take away her rape. It can't take away the silence and the shame brought upon her with the systematic erasure of her by her brothers. But as um, last night, uh, Ayala, a different Ayala spoke last night, and she said she was, um, she's the, was the head of a rape center crisis for many years, and she said the people who do the best healing in those circumstances are where one person stands up for them and listens to their story. So in this case, Yaakov is that person. Yaakov is the one that sees what's happening with his sons and that dynamic, and he takes note of it. Now we could say a lot about what he didn't do prior to that moment, but he has this strong desire and love to protect Dina's offspring, and by calling her a miracle, he completely rewrites the story. And recognizes in many ways the miraculousness of her survival and how sometimes unlikely it is that someone who endures such pain and such trauma actually will survive physically or emotionally or spiritually. And that Osnat or At Nes, actually her name is a signifier of the possibility to transform pain into amazing existence and the power of that possibility and the power of people to see that transformation, to honor the transformation and to listen to those who are going through that trine of transformation and to also put an amulet on them to help them be protected along the way. <clears throat> I don't think this story, uh, this Midrash, only offers redemption to Dina or to her daughter, Osnat. It is also a tikkun to the Torah. It is a healing to the Torah and a recognition that revelation is ongoing. 
that the uncovering and unfolding of Torah, if you think about the famous statement by the rabbis that the Torah was given as black fire on white fire, that the black fire is the words we see, but the white fire is the wholeness and inclusion of God's entirety of the story, which is not always visible to us, and which sometimes takes someone else to bring forth, like the women who write Midrashim and Der Shuni, and this specific one by Ayala. Sometimes the Torah is devastating, but sometimes it can be repaired when other people are given a chance to be its revealers, to give voice to those that have been silenced, and not only to give voice to them, but see their trauma, see their resilience, see the divine image that is in them, like Indina and her daughter, and see that that is actually a miracle. And someday, perhaps men and women, and all those that are in between, since we know that we're on a spectrum these days, will have a voice in the text. Wouldn't that be a miracle? And perhaps that will be true also not in the text, but in life writ large. And perhaps someday we might look at each other and all those who strive to live in a world of peace and justice and love and dignity. Perhaps we might be able to say to one another, your existence is a miracle. We could say that to the Jewish people too. We are about to enter the seasons of miracles with Hanukkah in the coming weeks, beginning on Thursday night. May we one day look around and see the miracle in humanity and hold each other up, no matter what gender, what religion, Israeli Jew or Druze or Palestinian, and say, At Nes, you are a miracle, or Ata Nes, you are a miracle, or a temnisim. They are miracles. And perhaps someday we will say, Neska do akshav. There will be a great miracle that happens now.